And I just want to start off this service by saying what an honor it has been to serve at this church. Um, we've been here, or I've been here for about three years, um, and it's just been really amazing to watch them uh, grow in the ways that they have. Actually, funny story, I didn't tell this the first service, but the very first person that I met whenever I came in, uh, came into the youth group to be a leader was Jake uh, and uh, Lake, the previous youth leader, had introduced me to Jake, which is the first person I'd met. And I went in for a sh- handshake. He was going in for a handshake, and then he psyched it out and dabbed and ran away. And I was like, this is going to be crazy. And it has been for the past three years. But it's been so amazing watching them grow. Um, like, like Tori said, this is a service almost completely run by youth. We had um, youth run the kids' wings, and we had Emerson and Kylie lead the, uh, the Power Hour skit as well. And I just want to say that I'm so proud of each, um, each of our youth in the ways that they've grown. Um, one thing in particular that we have really focused on within our youth group is something that I feel like I never got whenever I was um, their age. Um, and that is learning to recognize shame, what shame is and what it sounds like, what it looks like in our lives and how do we combat our shame. Or we've heard like, yes, place your identity in Christ, but how do we do that? I remember growing up thinking, okay, I know that my identity is supposed to be in Christ, but what does that even look like? How, what, how do I act? How, what am I supposed to do in order for my identity to be in Christ? And so we've actually done, uh, we've spoke on this for the past three years. Um, around this time, we always speak on uh, placing your identity in Christ, what that looks like. And we've really make, made that one of the, the priorities of our youth group. And through this, we've seen them grow so much. We, we've even had them come up each year um, in, in when it's like that time of the year, and they're like, oh yeah, can we talk about the I am statements? Can we talk about our identity in Christ again? Because what, one thing we're realizing is that this is a generation that is craving to know who they are, craving for somebody to speak into their life, and, and they're finding that in God. And it's, and it's been so awesome. I remember, I remember being their age just a couple years ago. I'm still kind of young. I was a junior in high school and I loved playing soccer growing up. And so we had this really big game coming up um, and it was against this team in Warren, Ohio. And this was the qualifier to, to go to state. And so our team was determined to beat this Warren team. But Warren, Warren was like the Goliath team. Everybody knows what I'm talking about when I mean the Goliath team, right? The team that you're like, you look at them and you're like, how are we going to beat them? First of all, they had way more players than we did. Second of all, they literally looked like Goliath. They like were huge and we were like, how are they high schoolers? It was crazy. But we were determined. We were like, we're going to win this game. We're going to win this game. Five minutes in, our goalie gets headbutted in the head by one of their players and goes down and has a concussion, gets thrown out of the game. And we didn't have a backup goalie. And so who did they put in goal? Not me. They did not put me in because that would have been really bad. But we just put whoever could catch a ball the best in the goal. But actually, he was probably about the size of some of our sixth and seventh graders. He was pretty tiny, which is not good if you're trying to guard a a humongous goal. Um, but I was the defender at the time, and I, I remember saying, I'm not going to let them score. And I was feeling super confident. And I had played the, one of the best games that I had ever played in my career. Um, and there was even one moment where they dribbled past the goalie, and it was an open goal. They shot it into the goal, and last minute dove as far as I could and barely headbutted it out. It was beautiful. It was something that would be on, like, Airbud, but for humans. I... I I don't know what kind of movie that is, but it was awesome. The crowd went wild and I felt amazing. But with 12 seconds left, it was tied up. They were dribbling down the field, kicked it in between my legs, ran around me and shot and scored a goal. And we lost the game with 12 seconds left. I remember feeling so crushed 
uh, feeling so upset about losing that game. I remember going home, laying in bed, and just remember whispering like, oh, I'm so stupid. I'm so worthless. I can't believe I lost this the game. What are people going to think about me in the morning whenever, whenever I show up to school? What are people going to say about me when they find out that it's my fault that we lost the, the game? It's all my fault. Okay, now I'm looking and I'm realizing it's kind of an overreaction, right? How many of you guys, how many of you parents have looked at your kid and, and seen them have a meltdown and be like, eh, they're overreacting a little bit. Can I get an amen? Yeah, that's right. That's right. So I was overreacting just a tiny bit. But I will say, like I said, I've been, I've been here for um, a few years. The, the first year, it was actually the first few months that I had been here at Hillsdale Church, and I needed to be here um, pretty early to set up in order to teach. And I remember I was running late, and I sprinted out the door, ran to my car, realized that I didn't have my keys, ran back and realized I had locked my car keys into my house, and I needed Tori to come pick me up. So not only was I late, but I made Tori late as well. I'm sorry, Tori. It was, it was, yeah, it was just a rough morning. But I remember whispering those same things over myself again. Oh, I'm so stupid. I'm so irresponsible. I'm so worthless. How can I do this? What is Jerry going to think about me whenever I'm, whenever, whenever we show up late? And so what I'm realizing, first of all, the one thing that I'm realizing in this season is that anytime I mutter those things under my breath, whether I'm kidding, joking around, or whether I'm serious, any time that I say, oh, I'm so stupid, what I'm actually do, doing is not only speaking that over myself, but I'm also speaking that over God. Why? Because we were created in God's image. Any time that I say that I'm stupid, I'm actually speaking that not on, o- only over myself, but over the image of God as well. The second thing that I, I realize, or I am realizing is that insecurity isn't just something that we grow out of naturally. It's something that we'll deal with for the rest of our life. I remember being in high school and being like, oh, I can't wait until that one day where all of a sudden on my 22nd birthday, I become confident and perfect and it's amazing. But that hasn't happened yet, so I'm still waiting. But it also, I will say that it's easy for us, or I said us, for you guys, I'm not a parent, for you guys to see your kids and see what they're going through and see that meltdown they have or that time that they are insecure and be like, oh, they'll grow out of it. They'll, they'll be confident. But what I'm realizing is that insecurity isn't just something that we'll grow out of. Insecurity is actually attached to our humanity because we are imperfect. But what I'm realizing and the good news is that we are not alone in our humanity. Why? Because Jesus came to this earth, lived as a human, felt the full range of emotion, dealt with shame, dealt with fear, anxiety, stress. He faced all of these things, temptation. But he, the difference is his, he knew how to combat it. And he, he combated all of those things with knowing his true identity in Christ. So we're going we're gonna, to, if you have your Bibles, flip to... Uh, Matthew chapter 4, and we're going to dive into the story of the temptation of Jesus. But before we do, uh, Matthew chapter 4, before we do, I just want to briefly um, explain where we're at in the story and the life of Jesus. So right before, uh, so, uh, right before Matthew 4, in Matthew three thirteen, it says, Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? Jesus replied, let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this, to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went out, he went out of the water, and at that moment heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. This is my son whom I love, and with him I am well pleased. So this is the story of the baptism of Jesus. And, and recognize that um, this is before Jesus fed the 5,000. This is before he healed the sick, healed the blind. All he did was get 
uh, was get baptized, and God could not contain his excitement. God could not contain his joy. God, God could not contain his love for his son. And so he said, that's my boy. He literally erupted from heaven because he got so excited saying, this is my son whom I love and with him I am well pleased. Before Jesus did anything, all he did was get baptized. And so it's easy to look at this, for us to look at this moment and be like, oh, that was cool. Okay, on to the next chapter. Um, But what I believe is that Jesus didn't just take this moment and be like, whoa, that was kind of cool dude. He, I believe that he actually carried this statement, this is my son whom I love and with him I am well pleased. I believe that he carried that on with him for the rest of his life. It was a staple for who he was. It was his identity. So I find it crazy how immediately after we go into the temptation of Jesus. So if you want to, we're in Matthew chapter four, if you want to follow along, or you can just read up on the screen. It says, then Jesus was led by the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against stone. Jesus answered him, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left and angels came and attended him. So, I remember I, growing up, I, I'd heard this story before, but I didn't really know the deeper meaning behind it. I was just like, that's kind of random that he like took him to this place and this place and this place. But I'm, I, I realize now that there is a deeper meaning behind this. It actually reveals to us three lies that we believe every day about our, our identity. And so first, Satan uh, Satan came to him while he was fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. Obviously, he was hungry. And he said uh, to Jesus, if you truly are the son of God, turn these stones to become bread. The first lie of our identity is I am what I do. I am what I do. What, What Satan was actually saying in this is, if you truly are the son of God, prove it. Do this crazy miracle to prove your worth, to prove your value. But Jesus, for the past 40 days and 40 nights, instead of feasting on bread, he literally says, man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. When just a couple of verses before that in chapter three, God had spoken to him and said, this is my son whom I love and with him I am well pleased. So, Jesus, for the past 40 days and 40 nights, instead of feasting on bread, he was feasting on, I am a beloved son and God is already proud of me. I'm a beloved son and God is already proud of me. So that when the time that Satan came to tempt him, he didn't need to prove himself by turning these stones to bread because he already knew his value. He already knew his worth. He already knew his identity. And so then... Satan took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple in in Jerusalem with everybody watching. I can imagine that everybody's gathering around thinking like, what is this dude doing standing on the top of this this temple? Uh, Very odd. I know that I would swarm and see what was going on. So Satan tells him, if you truly are the son of God, jump off of this temple and have the angels catch you. The second lie that we believe about our identity is I am what others think of me. What Satan was saying in this is that uh, if you truly are the son of God, prove it to everybody around you. 
If you truly are powerful, then prove it. Show everybody what you're made of. But Jesus had been feasting on, I am a beloved son and God is proud of me. God is already proud of me. It doesn't matter about what others think of me because God already loves me and God is already proud of me. So that when this time came, he didn't need to. He didn't need to fall for Satan's temptation. And so he said, do not put the Lord your God to test. Again, I believe he was feasting on, I'm a beloved son and God is proud of me. Next, Satan uh, takes him to the uh, the highest mountain and shows him every single kingdom in the world, shows him all these riches. And he says, all of this I will give to you if you bow down and worship me. To me, that sounds kind of heavy, right? Like bowing down and anyways. So that's, that, I find that just like crazy. But the third lie about our identity is I am what I have. I am what I have. Satan was saying, if, if you just bow down and worship me, if you, if you forget about God, then I will give you every single thing in this world that you want. Every single thing. But Jesus had known his true identity. I am a beloved son, and God is already proud of me. So he said, away from me, Satan. I find that, I don't know why I found that funny that he just said, away from me, Satan. Because like, if Tori and I or somebody and I were like with a, in, in a fight, and I said, away from me, Tori, or away from me, someone, it would just be odd. I, I just find that really funny. But he said, away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And after that, Satan left and the angels came and attended him. And he had his victory in this battle. He had this victory over fighting his temptation through knowing his, his true identity. Now I know that it's, it, 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 we can all look at um, these three sayings, these three statements, and think of times that we've believed this. I am what I do. We can look at ourselves and be like, yes, I am working this job, but my neighbor has a better job. Therefore, I must not be as valuable as them, or I, might, I much, must not be worth as much as them. Or we can... We can feel like we're walking on eggshells with our, with our friends or our uh, family members whenever there's times of conflict and times of tension because we're, we're worried what, about what they're thinking about us. Or we can uh, compare and think, yes, I have this house and I have this car, but my car breaks down every so often. But their car, they, they don't have car problems man, they're so much better off than me. They must, must be more valuable. And we can compare ourselves to others around us but it actually doesn't have to do with anything of those, of those sorts. It just has to do with, I'm already enough. I'm, God is already proud of me. This is what it looks like to place your true identity in Christ. Jesus was able to fight temptation. He was able to fight fear, shame, anxiety, stress. He was able to fight these things with, I am a beloved son and God is proud of me. We fight these things in our everyday life through knowing and being confident in who we are in Christ. In who we are in Christ. And so this is, this. we're going to, getting ready to do this exercise. So if you guys have your bulletins, I want you guys to flip to the back. If you don't, then I want you guys to, if you can, pull out a notepad or just your notes on your phone, whatever you can write something down with. And on the back of that bulletin, it says, who do you say I am and who do you say I am? That is not a typo. That is meant to be there. Don't worry about it. So uh, on the left side, we're going to do this exercise in just a second, but I just want to say that this is something that we do with our youth every single year. And every year, it, it's different for all of us. Why? Because we, you can never reach a maximum of finding out who you are in Christ. That's, to me, that's, that's amazing because that means that we can never get bored of like, oh yeah, I'm a beloved son and God is proud of me but we can actually never reach the end of our identity in Christ.
And so we do this every year with our teens. But what we're going to start off doing is uh, on the left side, who do you say I am? I want you guys to answer this question as if God was sitting in this room with you one-on-one and he asked, who do you say I am? So here are just some examples. It doesn't have to be straight off this list, but God is a good father. God is enough. God is proud of me. God is present. God is powerful. Any of these on this list, it it could be whatever it is in your own words. If God was sitting one-on-one with you in this room and asked you, who do you say I am? What would you say to him in this moment? What would you say to him in this season of your life? So we're just going to take a second, and I want you guys to write down as many as you can for uh, 30 seconds to a minute. Awesome. So the reason I had you talk about who God is to you at first is because we can't know who we are in Christ if we don't know who Christ is to us. Again, I want to say we can't know who we are in Christ if we don't know who Christ is to us. So I hope you guys could find um, just a few things of who you would say God is in your life in this season. So we're going to move on to the next um, the uh, the next part of it. And this is, if, if God was sitting in this room right now, if it was just you and him, what would he say about you? What would he say about you? I want you guys to truly tr- uh, uh, listen to the, the voice of God and listen to him speak because he's going to give you, um, he's going to give you these statements if you listen. So here's just a few examples. I am enough. I am loved. I am significant. I am not alone. I am worthwhile. I'm special. You, you can read the rest of those. But whatever resonates with your heart, if you're reading through this, and whatever resonates with your heart the best, I want you to write those down. We're going to play a video of an example of um, all, a, a ton of our youth just coming up with their I am and God is statements and proclaiming it over their life. So we're going to show this video. But as we're showing this video, I want you guys to look through your list and circle one that resonates with you the best on both sides. I am destined to do great things and God can't wait to see how I feel when I do those great things. I am significant, God is my savior. I am forgiven, God is almighty. I am a difference maker and God is knowing of the future. I am a vessel and God is my father. He is a strong foundation and I am his disciple. I'm worthy in the eyes of God and God is my rock. I am extravagant and God is creative with my path. I am the Son of God, and God is my path maker. God is powerful, and I belong. I am the Son of God, and God is the provider of my confidence. I am lovable, and God is trustworthy. I am set up for success, and God is faithful. I am important, and God is family. God is my Father, and I am the Son. I am loved. I am unique and God is the never-ending listener. I am a good gift and God's love is unconditional. God listens and I am important. I am unique and God is what makes me better even when I don't think so. God is my protector who loves me unconditionally and when I grow up, God will be proud no matter what. God accepts me. I am perfectly made by Him. 
God is supportive and I am loved. God is there for me and I am strong. God is my encouragement and my strength and I am accepted in all things. I am a gift and God is proud of me. I am chosen. God is cheering for me. God is the provider of my joy and I am found capable. I am grateful and happy for everything I have. God is the one I lay in on all my secrets. God is the great potter and I am a fragile jar of clay. God is the light in the dark. I am faithful and worship. I am enough and God is pursuing me. I am enjoyable and God is loving. God is helping me. And what am I? Uh, I'm forgiven. Can you guys feel uh, just the atmosphere of this room change when people take hold of their true identity? When people not only take hold of it, but they proclaim who they are in Christ. It is an atmosphere changer. And you can feel it in this room, and that's the Holy Spirit. That's what the Holy Spirit does. And so what we are going to do is, I'm going to have you guys stand up. Everybody stand up. Oh yeah, oh yeah. And on the count of three, we are all going to, whatever you circled uh, on both sides or whatever you came up with, we're all going to say it at the same time. Don't worry, we're all going to say it at the same time. So nobody around you is going to be listening and being like, what are they going to say? It'll be fine. And if you're nervous, just realize that when we do this with our youth, we have them all stand up on their chairs and scream it as loud as they can. So I'm not going to say... I'm not going to tell you guys to do that, but if you guys want to, feel free. Um, yeah, so we're going to do that on three. Are you guys ready? You promise you won't leave me hanging? Okay, because it'll be really awkward if you do. Okay, three, two, one. God is the provider of my joy, and I am found capable. Awesome. This is what it means to, be, to place our identity in Christ. This is what it means to proclaim our identity.